Welcome. As I say, some of you hear this every time you're on a call, but I'm Sue Anstis. I'm co-founder of the Women's Walk Collective with Kate Hannon, who's on, on my left on the screen here. Um, and as I say, it's grown, the collective's grown very rapidly, and this is the first event that we've done of this kind with a, a bit more of a bringing some guests in into the webinar. So before we get started and I uh, introduce them, a little bit of housekeeping where I just tell you what's coming up in the next couple of weeks or so. So uh, next Wednesday, May the 5th at 1pm, we've got Getting Started with Crowdfunding. So we've got Jess Bailey who's going to talk about crowdfunding and the whole process of, and it was actually Joelle, Joelle from Baseball Softball that introduced us to Jess and we've had a fantastic call with her. So really quite exciting. If, even if you're crowdfunding now, you're thinking of it for the future. Uh, looks like a great session. Our next networking call, which is uh, where we just introduce some women from the sector, talk about their careers, and we go off into our small rooms and network, is on May the 11th, so Tuesday, May the 11th at 3 p.m. Uh, we've got on May the 18th at 5 p.m., marking 100 days to the Paralympics, with um, we're talking about how we create a legacy from Tokyo with some para athletes. So we've got uh, GB para athlete Samantha Kinghorn, an Irish para swimmer. Um, Ella Keen coming to join us, which is fantastic. Um, we've then got a session with the ECB talking about their incredible inclusion programme to attract South Asian women into cricket. Uh, that's on May 25th. We've got another networking meeting in June. And then finally on June 30th, we've got a fantastic session with Dr. Karen Llewellyn, who's here on the call today, um, around active listening. And, and Kate and I have, have had a chat with Karen and we are very excited about that. So that's at 1 p.m. on June the 30th. Uh, so all those dates, Kate shared a fantastic roundup in the LinkedIn group today. I think it was this morning, wasn't it? And all the links are there to register for any of those events. So uh, please do go back into the LinkedIn um, group and you'll see the links there. And we will also be sending an email out next week with all the links in too. So we'll, we'll get the details in one way, many ways actually to you. So that's it. That's my quick five minutes of hello and welcome and introductions. So I'm really excited today and so pleased. It's, I, I've only in, I invited three women and they've all said yes, which is amazing. And they're all members of the Women's Sport Collective too as well. So it isn't as if we've gone outside to bring people in. They're all, all um, active members of the collective anyway. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome Lizzie Arnold, Marilyn Okoro and Catherine, Kat Copeland. Uh, and uh, I think you can probably see them all on screen there. So I'm just going to go around. I've got some questions for each of them that I'm going to put to them. Uh, but we'd really love to hear your questions too. So a couple of you have sent questions across. So as we're going through, uh, if you've got questions, please do pop them into the chat function uh, and we can take you off mute and you can ask them yourselves. Uh, but we're really nice to have some of your uh, involvement and, and interaction in that too. So I guess just to kick off with, if I can start, I've got, I've got Lizzie, Marilyn and Kat, so I'll got work my way across that just to start with. Uh, it'd be fantastic if you could just, um, I guess, introduce yourself a little bit, but maybe share some of your career highlights, because not everyone will know, I think everyone does know, but not everyone may know all, all that you've done and achieved. So uh, that'd be great if you wouldn't mind doing that introduction just to start with. So Lizzie, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Sue. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to look across my screen and see three pages of uh, women who love sport and are interested in sport. So that's a huge blessing. I'm really looking forward to today. Um, I am a, was a skeleton athlete. I still say I am a skeleton athlete because it's, it is a part of me that, you know, I still have my crash helmets in the house, you know, that, I'm, that kept me safe. I have um, some random trophies from Austria from the early days that I'm very proud of. I came through a talent search, so it wasn't a sport that I grew up loving. I was um, trying to become a Denise Lewis and realized I just wasn't good enough. And fortunately, UK Sports saw that I did have some skills, but to redirect it. So in Skeleton, it took about four years um, before I was selected for Sochi 2014. Um, and then I competed my second Olympics in Pyeongchang, that was 2018, um, brought home gold in both, but they were very different um, experiences. Um, I, I love my sport, but it was so, t it was tough. It was a tough 10 years and I think I was ready to retire uh, two and a half years ago. So my career highlight actually was probably the 2015 World Championships. Um, when I won gold so I kind of had all the um, 
all the big uh, achievements, all the big titles together. And it was purely because I only won that because of my team. My mum had breast cancer. We were going through loads of crap. And um, sometimes in sport, it's, you see a skeleton athlete by themselves down the track. And I didn't win by myself. I only was able to win because of the support um, from everyone else. And I'm really proud of that. Um, and yeah, that's a bit about me. I won't go on too much because I don't want to waste everyone, you know, the time. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be here today. And please ask any questions. Nothing out is out of bounds. I love that. Lisiana worries about wasting our time. You're not wasting your time. It's fabulous. Uh, but we will come back to you to find out more. And that's really interesting in itself. I've already, yeah, I, that's really interesting to hear that as, that as your highlight. Uh, rather than the, the goals which people would automatically assume wouldn't they um so can I move across to, to Marilyn and, and the same question to you really so a little bit more about your your career history really and and then your kind of highlights yeah sure thank you so much Sue hello ladies this is such a pleasure to see so many familiar faces such as the power of networking and when women get together and all love sport so I am freshly freshly retired <laughs> to eight weeks ago um, and I am a two-time Olympian, so I went to Beijing and I went to 2012, both very different experiences. And I literally, running was not really my initial dream, uh, but it was implanted and embedded from the age of 10. And I literally ran with it. I grew up in northwest London, an area called Stonebridge, which is tucked nicely behind Wembley Park. <laughs> Um, and at 10 years old, I got to go to a lovely boarding school, which was really the, you know, the making of me and the making of Marilyn the athlete. And it was thanks to my special coach, George Harrison, who not only saw I had talent, but he saw that I lacked a lot of opportunity and he decided to fill that gap. And, you know, literally he supported me in those early, really formative years. Didn't really know what I was doing. Didn't really have an idea of my talent, but I was having so much fun. I made so many great friends, uh, which has continued to be the pattern <laughs> and you know I, I ended up at the Olympics as he told me I would at 10 years old and you know I went to the University of Bath which was an amazing centre for excellence for sport and you know I literally was doing a French and politics degree one day and the next day I was you know selected for the Commonwealth Games to represent Team England and that is where I really sort of started to believe in myself and I just ran with it all the way up until 2012 and then, you know, there is no glory without a story. And that for me is when things started to take a downward trajectory. Uh, and I was on the other side of, of all the highlights and the glory. Um, and I just realized there's, you know, there's more to sport than just having fun, having a go. You know, it is a business, there's winning and there's losing. And, you know, there's so many lessons that I've learned from this journey and so many incredible people that I've met. One lady, particularly Alex Wallace on this call, who was really a sustaining factor for me um, and why it took me so long to retire. <laughs> and I'm an ambassador for the Midridge Foundation as well. Um, and so currently I am now, um, you know, treading the waters of transition and, you know, I love to dabble in public speaking. I'm not shy, as you can see. Um, and I'm also a transition and mindset coach, newly sort of qualified life coach, which is very exciting. So I am, you know, I'm just an advocate. I love to level the playing field. So I love what the Women's Sport Collective is all about. And I just love networking with like-minded, awesome women. So thank you so much for having me today. Excellent. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, I say with each of you, we could do an hour just with each of you. You couldn't be really digging further in, but maybe that's for, that's for something in the future too. <laughs> but thank you, Marilyn. And, and Kat, across to you too. And actually, Kat, of all of you, I think I met Lizzie once before, but Kat and I have met and, and talked in, the past, in a whole other world, it feels like it wasn't that long ago, was it? But... Uh, do tell us your story. Yeah, hi. Just to echo Lizzie and Marilyn, like absolute pleasure and honour to be here. Um, so I, maybe slightly different, I always did want to do rowing. So I started rowing when I was 14 and literally one of my career highlights to this day is winning the Peterborough Year 14 Championships. That felt to me like my Olympics. And that was just for me, I think, I just feel honoured to have had a career in sport because I just, I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, there were a lot of ups and downs. And I think like Lizzie and Marilyn, I had um, I went to two Olympics and I had very different experiences at both of them, both in terms of lead up and result. Um, but yeah, I started rowing at school and I worked up through the age groups, so junior, under 23, and then senior elite. 
Um, and when I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, but I knew I loved rowing. So I took a gap year thinking that I was going to train full time, see where that took me. That turned into a couple of gap years. Um, I went to the under 23 World Championships and won that. That was one year before London. And I thought at that point that was my peak and I was going to retire. And I actually did retire for three weeks, started at university. And then that was obviously the season where I was going to be a home Olympics, London 2012. Um, and I was at uni for a few weeks and I just had this itch because at that point I was third in the rankings and I needed to be top two to be selected. And I was just like, if I don't try this, I'm always going to regret it. Like, I'm just going to regret not knowing. Um, so I turned back up at home with all my stuff, left university. My mum shouted at me a lot. <laughs> um, and yeah, sort of from there, then I just, luckily it worked out really well for me. I got picked um, for London and I retired just over two years ago. Um, yeah, that would be, uh, and career highlights, I won in London. We didn't do so well in Rio, but I would say actually for different reasons, both are highlights for me. And that lovely picture, I love that picture of you with your girl. It'll, that'll haunt you or stay with you forever, won't it? That picture when you've won that. <laughs> Not sure how lovely that is to have that as, as people's memorable moment of you, that amazing picture. Marilyn, did you share a highlight with us there? Hmm. <laughs> there were so the many. Spot, there were so many. I didn't particularly, um, but definitely your first Olympic is <laughs> always a highlight. So making the team and it actually being something that is realised. You know that was a seed that was planted age ten by, you know, a, a male coach, and I just got that confidence from him. And then to realise that at twenty two was was awesome. So that was, and also I ended up getting a, a bronze medal ten years later, but I got it. <laughs> Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, a whole that's other a, webinar. Oh, the whole story there, isn't there? Exactly, <laughs> yes. exactly. Um, so it'd be fabulous uh, to go on, and it's interesting, isn't it, in terms of that transition out of elite sport, because you're all at fairly different stages now. So to know a little bit about that in terms of how that has been from you um, and what you're doing now, and I obviously realise, Marilyn, that's kind of very fresh and new, um, but but maybe to start, I, d I can go in the same order. I can change the order. Who knows? Switch it up. <laughs> Switch it up a bit. Okay. So, uh, well, you're you're off of mute, Marilyn. So I'm going to come back to you. So, I guess just in terms of that whole decision, to, you know, why you made that decision to to not keep going for Tokyo, if and when, uh, mm. and, and how that how process has been in terms of that decision making, and what you're looking to do now, really. Yeah, so I'm in the midst of it, which is quite a, an entanglement, really, transition. You go through lots of transitions in the journey, but the I guess the major one, the guaranteed one, is you're going to transition out of the sport. Um, and it took probably about five years to come to that confidence and that place of certainty. And actually, it's quite interesting that uh, Liz is on the call from Future Proof Pro because I've met some incredible companies doing work in this space. Um, but it just didn't work out for me. And I remember getting on a call in December to lovely Liz, who's on here. And I really didn't know whether I was going to run another step or, you know, or actually just pack it in. Um, and I think the mapping out we did there and then starting to see myself in other spaces, perhaps I hadn't even considered like the corporate world. I hadn't really seen myself working there, but we it was suddenly becoming a reality. And also something that was quite unique to them was the fact that I was connected with a really great psychologist and hypnotherapist and Claire. Um, and so I was actually starting to deal with the process and the identity issues which is a major factor that you go through that nobody really talks about. And I literally just decided to, to do what I wanted to do for the first time in a long time. And that was, it was okay not to run. So on the 31st December, I actually had that peace and resolution in my head. And then I had to leave it, you know, a little while to make sure it marinated because much like Kat, I have retired a few times. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I took the month of January to be really intentional about it and then announced it in February. And it's literally been like this massive boulder has moved um, in a great way in terms of opportunities and things that I would love to, you know, I feel like I'm a jack of a lot of trades and then as my athlete mindset, you've got to master them all. Um, so initially it was very confusing and I needed to sort of streamline, okay, what do I actually want to do? And then the next big question was for me was, yeah, as athletes, we have loads of ideas. How are we going to monetize this? How are we going to understand the business? So networking was just massive for me and it still is. 
LinkedIn became my favorite social channel before. It was just like put up a posh picture and leave it there. But now I'm, you know, I'm making so many connections and business connections and understanding the business behind sport. Um, but also I've just got a heart for mentoring and supporting whoever I can, whoever can resonate with bits of my journey. So that's where the speaking comes in and the coaching, because as we know, there's so much power in sharing your story. And yeah, I'm still finding my feet. I was working for a, a little charity here in Wigan um, and literally just got made redundant yesterday. So that is the universe's way of kicking me into <laughs> action. <laughs> so I'm going to hit the ground running. If not, I'm just going to work for the Mintridge Foundation full time. <laughs> you said it here first yeah, yeah. Yeah. but it's hard it's really hard and um there's a lot of work to do in that space and that's literally also a passion of mine and you know I'm in a working group and we've got a really good seminar tonight and we're looking at how whether this the holistic and, and performance can go together and whether we can come up with a, a holistic model of performance and um produce some sort of documentation to back it up Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much and good luck. And we, we did talk a little bit before we came on around what had happened to you yesterday. But I think it is, that I don't, it's a bit trite, isn't it? When one door closes, another one opens, but sometimes it does need that thing to push you uh, down the avenues to, to explore something uh, new too. So thank you for sharing that. Kat, I know that you, you've you been doing some work with us. one of the questions that's come through in terms of your working with uh, younger athletes and so on now, but do you want to talk about I guess, that, the process for you? Uh, and also what you what you did and what you're doing now. Yeah, mine was a messy, messy process. Um, so I retired just over two years ago. Um, I always thought I would, I'm this sort of person, I thought it would be quite clean cut after an Olympics. Um, but it actually, I mean, it obviously wasn't. Uh, I didn't have an injury, it wasn't selection. I just really honestly felt absolutely exhausted. <laughs> physically and mentally um, and I got to a point I remember our head coach had always said to me when I retired the first time because a bit like Marilyn I retired a few times ish um, and he said when you know you know and I was just paddling around one session and I'd been thinking about it for a while and I just had this gut feeling and I just knew and I just felt at peace with it and I think for me like I love I loved and love my sport so much and I think like a lot of athletes I only wanted to do it if I was wholeheartedly in it and doing it justice and when I was half out of it mentally I was like okay now's the time um and the first two weeks were amazing because I was a lightweight as well so I was like I don't have to exercise I can eat what I want life is great it was around Christmas as well I can see my friends and then after two weeks it literally hit me like a train um also, because I'm obviously like all of us, I'm very competitive. And when I retired, I just didn't have a clue. And I was like, I'm going to be the best at, at transitioning that anyone's ever been. I'm going to nail this. Um, and yeah, it's really hard. And I think hard for a few specific reasons for me. I think what Marilyn mentioned about identity, what I found really hard probably from about six months in was not having like a really clear purpose, like something that I really cared about to do every day. Um, an identity, because you've always had that a bit wrapped up with being an athlete. Um, and also for me, because I went into elite sport straight from school, not having like a clear process and set of steps that you have to work through like you just don't have that in the real world when you're an athlete if you want to win an olympic gold medal you know that you've got to have x time on an ergo lift this in the weights room do this time on the water and it might not be certain but you know you've got the best chance um but in life that there, there just isn't that which now i'm trying to embrace a bit but the first yeah the action plan and um, the first couple of years I was just like what is this I just felt like I was a bit untethered um so what I did was I for the first probably year and this is where I met you Sue first I just tried to speak to loads of people and just get loads of different work experience so I did some stuff in the city I worked at the BOA for a bit on one of their commercial projects um, I went into schools because I thought I might like teaching like for me that was a really really valuable year and I feel really lucky that I had the freedom to do that like to find out what I wanted to do and also to find out what I didn't want to do and what my new values were since I retired 
Um, and really funnily, the one thing I said I wasn't going to do when I retired was coach. And now, lo and behold, I am a coach. Um, so yeah, at the minute I started my own yoga business. I coach young girls, which I absolutely love. Um, and potentially also exploring moving into consultancy. But yeah, at the minute I'm coaching and I, I really, really enjoy that. And what happened to the biscuit making? Because I was really excited about that. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> Me and for everyone else, just to build them in, uh, we wanted to do like a subscription biscuit service where every um, month, I know everyone's laughing, every month you would get sent out um, like a gingerbread biscuit, a bit like Biscuitiers, but it would be an inspirational woman um, and you'd get a little card with more information on the woman. I was um, so that, excited. You can imagine. I was so excited about yeah, it. Yeah, that idea, and I can send you a picture, Sue, it hit the, um, it hit the floor when we tried to start icing and we realised <laughs> good at making the biscuits <laughs> so great idea if anyone's good at baking take it um, we it. could not make sellable biscuits I think I think it's a women's sport collective I think across the collective we all have a talent to do that I just love I mean, it does feel like it's a couple of years ago we did talk about it didn't we and I thought I'm really interested yeah. in your consultancy and went to talk to get park attracted but I'm really interested in the biscuit idea yeah. brilliant yeah. thank you that's fantastic and um uh Lizzie yeah in terms of your transition yeah I've, I've been sort of transfixed by the other two talking and um really appreciating your honesty as well I I so I think I transitioned first two and a half years ago I think now um my transition was made easier by having positions like the BOA athlete commission um and other things I was volunteering in as not only for something in my diary to focus on to be interested within the community but to have those conversations and, and interactions with people that I knew and who I really respected other athletes that I could chat to about the process because one thing I've missed more and more as it's gone the time's gone on is realizing that I can't do this or I can't do work or I can't do whatever without a team without seeing people and I think Covid has obviously made this more extreme but going from being motivated and doing the reps, doing the sessions, and knowing that good is good enough in the gym, that I can walk away, I can recover, and that's been agreed, and we've achieved that. Now, I found that I, someone, you know, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm like, I'm doing this, I'm studying that, and I've got this, and I'm really interested, in, but you, and I'm also a mum, and, and I find myself kind of making, um, not excuses, but I'm find, I'm trying to find something that I haven't yet got nailed on it's I'm an athlete you know that's easy no more questions um but I haven't yet kind of found that next thing not that I, I don't I wonder whether there is a next thing because what I was um encouraged to do and I, I believe was right was this sort of um portfolio career and, and a bit of this and a bit of that which is great because it, it fills my passions and my values but equally when do you say you know that's enough for the day that's enough um, networking or whatever so that's been a challenge is trying to manage that myself um at the same time as being a new parent and actually when i was thinking about this discussion i think going from sport straight into motherhood although it sort of kicked the gears completely to something else it really disrupted what I would, what I'm really passionate about, which is working with people, working under pressure and really going full tilt at something. Um, so that has, that's, you know, that's just life. I was 30 when I retired and that's what we decided to do next. Um, but that has been a challenge, I think. And it, I'm sure lots of you can kind of appreciate that as well. Um, I think, Kat, what you were saying about your work experience, I had to note that down because it was so good that you sounded motivated to search for different things, not only things you liked, but things you didn't like. I was an athlete similar to that, but I think one of the struggles is that um, having conversations with PLs, with performance lifestyle advisors, is something which many athletes put off far too for far too long. They don't really know what the service is for and they, and they wait until after they've retired. And many athletes, you're trying to do this work experience, and it and it it's 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 kind of too late. It need, this needs to be in our mind, in our heads, before the Olympics, 
But how do you have that conversation with someone without seeming as though you're not completely 100% committed um, to your sport? And, and that's something which I'm not, sh I don't know the answer for. And I really advocate um, working with PLs, discussing changes in um, our identities, in our physical shape, you know, all these inevitable changes which will come, um, which are kind of tricky to discuss, but we have to. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's really, really interesting. I don't know if you become a dragon mother then in terms of channeling everything into raising your little one. I, and then, I haven't heard that term before, but I'm absolutely that. I think that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a fantastic, I guess, do people know, I won't make you stand up, but you are obviously, you've got another addition to your family in, in terms of what you've been doing during uh, your retirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've got a toddler and then we've got another one on the way um, quite soon. So, and you know, I retired two and a half years ago. We went to New Zealand for six months because my husband was working in the America's Cup. So when I was doing Olympics, between that, in my middle two years, he had an America's Cup. And then I had an Olympics, he had an America's Cup. So that's been great and, and we love sport, but actually going to New Zealand as a supporter, as another half, as basically um, part of that team was really weird because I'm not a part of the goal, part of the process, part of the let's push it forward. I'm just sat there as a Judy Murray, um, which, yeah, it sounds great, but honestly, it's so dull. <laughs> I'm going to pass. Marilyn's got a quick question. I'm going to just embarrass myself by saying my battery says it's low on battery. And my daughter last night came upstairs and took my charger and I said it would be OK. Uh, so, Kate, you, you might be in charge for the moment. Marilyn's got a question and I was going to then go to lovely um, uh, Sue Story to ask her question. So I will just evacuate myself for a second to get a charger. <laughs> it wasn't really a question. It was just uh, like spot on, Lizzie, like we're never encouraged really to start with the end in mind. And uh, part of why I went into life coaching was actually to be that service to athletes. There are performance lifestyle advisors, but it's for a select group. And, you know, I, I, I really believe in supporting the 99% that perhaps, you know, they may never make it to an Olympics, but they're still working just as hard. Um, but yeah, that is a great service that is on, but I'd love athletes to start thinking about the strategy and the action plan before it's time to jump into it. and it's born out of my own experience you know I waited far too late to maximize the resources that I had no one taught me about finance and managing egos and and the, the business side of it and so I delivered a really good um, workshop last weekend with the Marathon Sports Foundation and they are actually they've got the youth talent program that supports sort of the next the next generation who are thinking about being elite athletes and it's just about encouraging them to be thinking about being elite on their terms uh, and you dictating that as opposed to putting all your eggs into say the federation's basket which is already pretty you know it, it's competitive it's sport this is what we do however let's empower them let's give them more knowledge and it's a lot of the stuff we begin with the math the, the Mintridge foundation with mentoring but you know if you are considering those heights because I really wasn't so I didn't really think about it and once I got to the elite world I just let everything be done for me and then all of a sudden when it went wrong you know cricket so it's about empowering athletes giving them that knowledge and absolutely right Lizzie like having those courageous conversations I just had my very first nutritional therapy session this morning and there's so much I'm learning about my body and what I'm going through and how it's changing and figuring out what Marilyn the woman looks like because for so long I've been the 800 meter body and I'm so you know it's it, it takes a while to get used to the habits <laughs> I am eating a lot I thought I ate a lot before and I'm eating a lot and I don't have something to justify it like Lizzie <laughs> um but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of work to be done, and it's just so nice to have you know the support around you, and and uh, yeah. So thanks for sharing that, Lizzie. Hey, you. I was going to say, so maybe a nice time, Sue Story, to uh, come off mute and ask your question to uh, to the athletes. Thank you. It's uh, really great to hear from you all. It's it's fascinating stories, and it's just you just watch in awe of of what you've all achieved. It's brilliant. Um, I guess I was just thinking from the NGB world, what's the one thing that you would change about how you were supported by your NGBs as you were on your journey? Is there, is there something that we can all learn to, to
to be better at to support you? Shall I maybe go first? Because I've got an answer in mind. Um, and I think it literally just links to what Marilyn and Lizzie were saying. Um, I think we have great PL support through the EIS. Um, in terms of my actual national governing body, the one thing that I found really hard was after I retired, I'll say one thing I found hard and one thing that's really good to maybe do instead. Um, when I retired, I then literally just had no contact. I had the meeting that said I was retiring um, and then I just didn't have any contact. No one spoke to me again, pretty much. <laughs> and that's really hard. Um, uh, yeah, I think I, I understand that they're there to do a job and really it's a performance thing at the end of the day. Like you've only got a certain amount of time and energy and then you wanna move on and focus on the next person that's actually gonna be performing. But I think maybe just like, keeping a little bit of contact even if it's just like an email or a note like a month after or like just two or three being like just checking on with how you're doing or something like that so I think that would be good um and then something that is really good that the EIS do that could maybe be more integrated into what my national governing body does um obviously performance lifestyle advisors do like more the career transition stuff but like Lizzie and Marilyn were saying there's so much more to transitioning out of sport as an athlete because it's your whole life um so as well as the identity piece I know these two just touched upon like your things that I didn't even think about like your body changes and how you feel so you feel differently about what your body's looking like you feel differently inside of your body I remember things like talking to my um PL advisor and I was really lucky to be linked up with the EIS have um, one PL advisor called Dawn Ayrton who's amazing and she just works with um, retiring athletes and transitioning athletes so she'll talk about other things so I remember asking her things like I know I need to exercise but how many times a week do I exercise I'm so confused like do I need to do it every day do I need to do it for an hour what makes me healthy what do I do now like and that stuff's crazy, you'd think as an athlete, I'd know how to do a training session, but I was so confused as to what it looks like in real life. So all the bits around the outside. Um, and I was really lucky to work with Dawn, but as far as I'm aware, there's only one of her and she covers transitioning athletes across loads of sports across the whole country. So if something could be integrated into national governing bodies, even if it's just like a seminar, on different things or what to expect or common uh, experiences that athletes have when they transition. I think that would be really good because half of it is just raising awareness. So athletes know, oh, this might be something that happens and it's normal. That's brilliant. That's, that's brilliant, but so shocking, isn't it? And especially for an NGB like British Rowing, that you just think, of, not that you would expect it from a smaller NGB, but it just it feels a bit shocking when it's some um, such a well-funded, well-run NGB to have let athletes go adrift but it's so really interesting to know what other NGBs do in terms of that uh, keeping an eye on and a supportive check of athletes uh, out of um, when they retire from sport. Um, Marilyn or Lizzie do you want to? Yeah thanks yeah I was going to jump in there I think um, there were really interesting points Kat and I think I, so I'm so I'm a, I work on the board of BBSA Bobsay and Skeleton at the moment, and I that's something I've noticed about. It's great to do an exit interview and to make sure athletes have that opportunity to feedback, but you almost need to almost be open to revisit it six months a year later when things have settled, and you you have a different perspective on the experience. And then I reflect, you know, how much responsibility is it of the NGB to keep reaching out to athletes who have retired and maybe moved on in a normal job that wouldn't be the case so how much energy and time um, do we have to ensuring athletes transition well when that is essentially considered with the PL service which I think extends to six months medicine you know other stuff for three months if athletes are on the APA system um, so I, I, I can see it kind of from both sides but one thing I, I think would be helpful um, is having sessions with athletes and staff about finances, about um, you know what on earth national insurance is, how to write a CV, and these these stuff are also covered 
covered with like athlete futures events and other things but to have an in-house one a half hour or an hour a month just covering different subject areas but discussing it in a in a in a space which you're not an athlete or a staff member you're a person so um I've done this in the past and very much um interacting with people as people um just their name and them and not identifying them as an athlete um because I think so often I love to identify myself as an athlete but if that's all I ever hear it's difficult to see myself in the future as something other than um so I think that potentially could be helpful um and uh I think skeleton as a small organization we are such a strong family um it's really everyone feels part of it and you are giving to the um to the collective performance the collective success i can see that in a big team when there are just so many people and you're really competitive for spots in the team or, or in the boat um that can be a bit more challenging so and um, that's just my reflection of um smaller winter teams that don't have as much money we do have you know we've been really well funded but we we're a much smaller program in comparison to rowing for example and in terms of sue's question of um uh, you know what, what they did well or what they could do better what would you say yeah so do better I think is those sessions those finance sessions or whatever and talking to people as people um what they did well I think is just um they have these amazing update emails each month which I really look forward to because it's all funny and stupid and just like yes we've got this important stuff which we need to get out to the to everyone and and, and to the supporters but um making sure there's a lot of humor and the fact that we go head first down an ice sheet, you know, it's, it's not a serious thing to do in life. It's, it is, we're so blessed to be able to do sport and, uh, and, you know, call it a career is fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. And Marilyn, what, what about you? Um, so basically a big part of my retiring was that I didn't want to step away feeling like that bitter, resentful athlete, because actually I have taken away so much from my career and I wouldn't have been able to do that with the amazing governing body being there um, however you know I am on this little mission to revolutionize the culture a bit um, and I've spoken to so many different athletes from different sports and I realize it's not unique to track and field it's not unique to me and actually here there is a problem especially when we're talking about things like athlete suicide and depression every day more and more athletes are being courageous and sharing their story so that's where I feel like these governing bodies have a duty of care to anyone who puts on that vest and, and represents their nation to whatever happens to them yes absolutely you know it's not going to be forever but that pathway needs to be a bit clearer um, and I think for me personally, the reason why I did my corporate governance course was because I needed to see people that represented me. I didn't see that throughout my career. When I look at board level, it's shocking, the, the lack of representation of women and black women. So I wanted to understand the language. I wanted to understand and maybe, you know, be able to, you know, share and give insights, you know, but using the right appropriate language rather than the I'm just so angry. <laughs> um, and, you know, that was an incredible course for me, which was sponsored by the PFA. So I had to go to another sport to, to you know, get that experience. And it's opened a world, the world of the boardroom for me. And I'm able to sit on boards, whether it's, you know, helping women and that have survived domestic abuse or going in onto a boardroom within sport. But it, I know that I'm helping to shape the culture by bringing my experience so that someone who can resonate with that will be um, sort of supported in a different way that I might not have considered before. Um, I think in terms of, you know, I'm specific to athletics, I would love to see the communication and transparency get better, especially when we're talking about things like selection criteria. Um, I'd also like to see, you know, the delivery of, um, you know, exactly my redundancy yesterday, the delivery was probably the worst bit. And, you know, I, I, it, I likened it to getting my letter in the post. At least I had a meeting there with the director, the new director. Um, but with athletics, I simply got a letter through the post. And after 10, 12 years of representing the nation at every single championship inside, indoors and out, I think I deserved a bit more than just a letter telling me that I wasn't a medal contender before I got my bronze. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot um, that, that could be done. And I, I believe athletics is in a crisis at the moment, but that's what it's going to take to shake up and revolutionize the culture and, and I'm you know I certainly sent a lovely email to Joanna Coates to let her know that 
uh, we're on side. There's so many people that are so happy to see her there. And what she's done with netball is extraordinary. And I'd love to see that filter into track and field and for it to, to survive and the legacy to live on. Lovely. Did she come back to you? Yeah, she did, of course. <laughs> That's <laughs> always good. Yeah, no, fantastic. That's brilliant. Uh, Claire from the RFU asked a couple of good questions. Did you want to ask your question? I guess you put a question there um, in terms of for uh, Lizzie, the toughest part. I'll let you ask it, but maybe you could ask it to all three, really. Yeah, um, obviously, we all know that you've got tough highs and lows. Um, but Lizzie, you do, did sort of mention over the 10 years that it, there were some sort of really tough times. Um, what was maybe some of the toughest stuff and, and how did you come out of that? And maybe who did you use around you? And, and were the NGB supportive in that those particular points as well? Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, and I'll try and condense my answer as much as I can. I think... The first Olympics was very much, um, I was a cog within this amazing system that knew how to produce performing athletes. So I was just making sure I was doing what I was told and advised to do and completing the sessions and going to Sochi. It was my race to lose, basically. I didn't know it at the time, but it was my race to lose. So it was all relatively simple. Um, then we got mum's cancer diagnosis three months after the games she's she's recovered really well I feel like I should always say that at the start but after I'd done five years full-on training and, and making sure I did exactly what needed to happen and then something within my normal life kind of goes haywire I felt as though I was being asked to um, do my rehab get in the gym with my manage my back do this and then take mum to chemo and, and make some batch cooking meals. And, and then also go to Kent's where I grew up and open a sandwich shop because Steve has opened this new sandwich shop and needs me to, to be there for free. And it was just like, where do I, how do I manage this as someone who's meant to look as though I have everything under control. And this is the happiest moment of my life after Sochi. But there's other there's life going on as well so i managed another year competed in the world championships which i mentioned and at that point i realized i cannot keep going at this rate and make it to pyeongchang like i'm just either gonna fall down and not get back up again or i have to be honest with the team and say like i'm physically and mentally exhausted similar to what actually kat mentioned earlier at some point in her career as well i'm exhausted and I, I, I just need to stop. I've got to stop for a bit. I can't keep going. And that, I didn't obviously know how they were going to react um, or support me or not, or, you know, how that all works. And I was really well supported. I took time off. I took a competition season off, worked out who I was as a person six years after I even went into skeleton, worked out what actually is my motivation. If you've already got a gold medal, which is awesome, but why would you go through the training process to achieve the same thing and with lots of psychology help and, and all of that and the whole team I worked out that um I my ambitions had to transcend the gold medal my ambition to be a better athlete had to be more than that um I had to recreate something called the <laughs> such a rubbish name but team Lizzie so I was a part of the team instead of being given the training programs so I was asking for a seat at the table um, to be part of the critical review meetings which I set up chaired wrote the minutes for every month and um, just really try to push it and push them push skeleton to try something different and fortunately um, it, it was received well the Olympic season was awful though I competed terribly worse results worse results got worse 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 didn't think I was going to get selected for Pyeongchang um, and at that point, it had to be very realistic and honest that something's not working, something's not right. And uh, I mean, the story ends well, but realising that as an Olympic champion going for my second Games, it was assumed that I knew what I was doing. Or you just need to think back to, you know, how you did it before you've done this already, you just need to do it again. Well, actually... We are growing change as people, all this stuff happens to us and you can't go back. What I did then doesn't work for now. So then 
you know, expecting myself to just go out and perform. And when it doesn't happen, that, you know, week in, week out, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't happen was really awkward. Um, so yeah, we, lots of talking with this Team Lizzie thing that I put loads of time in to build. But when it got to the critical point of before Pyeong Chang of everything going tits up, they were the people who actually knew what to say to motivate me or, or knew me well enough to make that change and be honest with me. Um, so um, lots of different mini tough things. Um, and then I'll just say really shortly, really quickly, after I um, came back from Pyeong Chang, I had a, an operation on my knee. Um, then my back went terribly badly. Um, but during that time, I had to have a huge amount of painkillers and couldn't walk, couldn't, you know, anything with these back issues. And it was then when I was in a really bad place mentally that the team, the medical team, my physios, you know, those people, you know, really did pull me up um, as a person and not as an athlete anymore. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of little tough times, but um, thank goodness everyone else was there to to keep me going. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the, yeah, I like the team as well. I've seen Maggie Alfonsi before, who's talked a lot about that supportive team during sport and then coming out of you know maintaining that post sport too. Um, Patricia, do you want to ask your question of, of everybody, really? It's a question for Kat, but would you like to ask it of everybody, Patricia? Yeah, I was just thinking as I heard everyone talking, it's probably applicable to everyone. Um, my question is, if you could go back and talk to yourself as a teenager, knowing everything that you know now, what would you say to her? I think what prompted the question was knowing that Kat works with, with young girls now, but um, it really is a question for everybody. That's a really good one. Um, oh, so much. Um, I think a big one for me is I'm quite self-critical. And I actually think if one thing went wrong, although it's, it, you know, it's different things, different things go right and wrong between London and Rio, it was that. And that was born, I think, in my teenage years. I wasn't very confident. I was quite self-critical and I was very humble, which I think if we're generalising in society, like, women are like a lot more humble and nice and polite um, than men. And I think that bears out in different ways. So when I coach my girls now, um, yeah, I want them to be like nice and polite, but I want them to have like a little bit of sass and a little bit of edge and like be calling like really confident calls in the boat and know that they know what they're doing rather than just always asking me questions and getting it from me. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it bore out for me in sport because I, I mean, I thought when I won the J14 championships, that was the peak of my career. And then when I won like J15 that champs, I thought that was my peak and I never thought I could do more. And I was really lucky, actually. I had some amazing coaches who set those sights for me. But I think if, we, if I could instill that in teenage girls now to be able to do that themselves, um, that would be really useful. Um, and it actually, the, the best thing that I was told when I retired um, was uh, by a different PL that I worked with, Mel. And I was looking at a job description for the job that I ended up doing at the BOA. And I think this is just a way it bears out in life rather than sport. So it's a bit more applicable to everyone. Um, and I was looking through it and I was just like, I'm not going to apply to this because I don't think I can do it. And Mel said to me, like a lot of female athletes that she works with will look at a job description and if they see like one or two things they can't do or they don't have experience in, they won't apply. And she's like, when I work with the male rowers, if they see one or two things they think they can do, they'll go for it and they'll just flag it. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I ended up getting the job. So I think I would really like to instill that in my girls a bit more, a bit more just like going going for it and being more confident. I don't think that's just an athlete thing, that analogy is it. I think we've seen that across the world of business too. Oh, yeah, brilliant points, Kat. What, uh, Marilyn, what about you? What do you think? You yeah, so um, I work a lot in the space of women and young girls. Um, I've actually teamed up with one of my former rivals, Becky Lynn, and we have a mentoring programme that we've just launched called The Graceful Girls. 
and initially we're starting with middle distance young ladies and she brought me on board to diversify it and also I want to extend that to you know young ladies in disadvantaged communities as well and you know Kat's completely on the money there it's about you know I go by the champion new coach because there are many times in my career I wasn't championed I, I wish I had the team that Lizzie had I wish I had the, the bravery to create that team and that's what I want athletes to understand you deserve to have that team it's project you you are the CEO who's in your boardroom and so for the young girls we're working with a lot of self image self-esteem work and it is about championing yourselves I want you to look in that mirror and champion you first before anyone else has to where are you getting your validation you know with social media age this is their their age this is you know I'm so I, I don't know what I would have done if I was going to school dealing with what I was doing with, and had to deal with social media so we do a lot of work around that and um you know I think it really helps them hearing from you know we've been on this journey that they're just beginning and we struggled and we overcame because we simply just wouldn't give up and yeah I'm, I, it doesn't need to be pretty it can be however you need it to be just champion you <laughs> and Lizzie what would you say to a, to a younger self do you think I think I in the past I've always had the message um just keep working hard and a lot harder than you think you need to However, I think it's almost more valid to remind myself um, that at 18, I was so serious and so committed and I missed out on loads of experiences. University, I was already in skeleton, you know, I, almost to make sure that the fun is there. And even when you're competing, still still just try and find that enjoyment whatever that looks like for you because if you're so serious and so committed and it hadn't worked out for me it just wouldn't really have been a positive experience so much of my sport life is it has been treated like a business and so so performance mindset wise um the one thing I really miss is all the people and the and the mates um, so just to, to keep that in our forefront that we are, we are going to die at some point. So we've just got to try and enjoy it a bit. <laughs> That's a profound thought for a person. Sorry. Who's trying to it, but just, <laughs> no, <it's laughs> um, Rebecca, Rebecca Martin, do you want to ask your question? We've got probably about five minutes left and I will finish on time, unfortunately, but I think it's important that we do. But Rebecca, do you want to just ask, we can perhaps get a chance on one more question. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, it was just, you know, in terms of thinking about your professional um, careers, when you've really struggled with maintaining that motivation or actually you've lost passion for it. Um, and then I guess examples of how you've then had to claw it back. Uh, and reinvigorate yourself to sort of then I get, guess get the energy to pursue and, and go forth again it's just any tips or things I suppose if you, well one of you've experienced that and then how you've how you've managed to claw it back Go? yeah Marion do you go yeah sorry I didn't, yeah. I couldn't get myself off mute <laughs> <laughs> that's fine um I mean I think it's one of the questions I get asked all the time when I go into schools you know what did you do did you ever not love running and absolutely there's many I wasn't a trainer I did not do this to train I did this to perform and win and so when all that validation was in my performance it was really hard when it wasn't going my way and it didn't go my way a lot um, and I think some of the things that really helped me was that when I was at that amazing boarding school, I was in the, I did lots of sports, first of all, lacrosse was actually my first love, netball, tennis. I was also in the choir, I was also in the debate team. And so there was all these different sides to me that I suddenly just had to dedicate to running because I was told I wasn't serious enough when I got to the elite world. And so it really helped having my, first of all, my core group of friends who could ground me and hold me and, you know, just loved me as Maz rather than just the runner and what I did in performance but also going back to some of my my loves and you know Kat touched on it as well like I don't know how to exercise without there being some sort of performance attached to it so I'm not running I haven't ran since December but I can't wait May 18th I'm going to start playing lacrosse again I'm going to play netball and tennis and just enjoy movement and so with my boot camps it's actually about just moving and starting where you are with with what you have and we do a lot of dancing to be honest because that's what I love. <laughs> Excellent, I love that. And Alex, thank you for sharing that beautiful quote. I get a bit emotional on the call here. Um, Kat or, or Lizzie? I should just name you. Kat, go on then, Kat. 
I don't really have loads to add to that. I think maybe also just knowing that I don't, I, I think it's normal and I don't think it's a bad thing, whether it's sport or a different career to sometimes have times when you don't feel motivated and you don't feel the passion and you don't love it. Cause I think that's just life and it is gonna up and down. I think the thing that I've always thought is like, if it continues for a you know, sustained period of time, um one of the things that actually sparked me to retire was I was walking my dog um and I'd been a bit like mm, for a while like a bit down about rowing and I walked past a homeless man and the homeless person stopped me walking my dog and was like are, are you okay you look really sad and I was just like oh my god that was like a light bulb for me I was like I have so much and I'm so lucky and I do this really cool job and someone stopped me like I must really be in a bit of a pit so I think if it's a sustained period of time it's actually being brave enough to be like like Lizzie said we're gonna die life's too short what is the actual thing you're passionate about now because it'll change um but if it's temporary just knowing that that's normal and that's okay and maybe just you know re going back to do you have the right people around you like Lizzie was saying the team really changes your experience what what's the end goal why are you doing it Lizzie's probably yeah. up for stuff yeah. to ask Lizzie's yeah. gonna bring bring us home Lizzie now oh, yeah really quick I think <laughs> end, end goal have that remind yourself of what you're in it for make sure your values are current so revisit your own personal values um, and, and how you like to be motivated and see whether they are actually being matched with your reality as well. Um, and the whole 80%, 100% thing, you know, we talk about percentages the whole time in sport, but do you actually need to be performing at 100% every day? Because you can't be an Olympic champion in whatever you do, you can't do it every day, it's inhuman. So can you manage, can you kind of get by? Could you bring your real bad days and your great days, can you kind of bring them to a level and just keep going at that, give yourself a little bit of breathing space as well. And um, that's certainly what I did. That's how I kept going for Pyeongchang. I just kept chicken and chipping away at what I needed to do and not what I, I expected of myself, the highest of the, you know, best of the best. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And we're exactly at two o'clock, which is fantastic. In my haste to go and find my uh, charger, I've lost my phone. So lovely Kate Hannon's going to take a quick photo of us. So if you're hidden away and you'd like to come forward and smile, that'd be very nice. I give people a chance to smile so we don't get too much uh, resting bitch face, which you do when you're sat back and we take one casually. So we'd like people to come forward and smile if you'd like to. And Kate will take some pictures. Oh, she's there now. Lovely. You've got to keep smiling there because you don't know uh, uh, you don't know which screen you're going to be on. Lovely. Are you moving across screens, Kate? You've done it. She's done it. Lovely. Thank you so much to Marilyn and Lizzie and Kat. That was, well, I'm, you can see all the lovely messages coming from the bottom here. That was just fantastic. We might have to do it again. It works so well. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and giving an, you know, the time today to come and talk to us. I know I've certainly learned so much. And I think it's, it's lovely. It's lovely um, as people to hear your stories. But I think there's some really practical stuff that a lot of the people that are here work within NGBs can take away and put into practice and those that are parents of children can take away and put into practice too uh, you know mothers and daughters etc and sons but um so I think we've I, I certainly feel we've all learned a huge amount just from uh, hearing from the three of you today so thank you so so much and we hope to see you at other events and, and um online meetings and maybe in person at some point later in the summer we've got some plans Kate and I hatching some plans to get people together uh, for later in the autumn so that'd be fantastic too so thank you so much to everybody um and we'll hopefully see you again next week week after as, as more events come up too so thank you very much indeed goodbye to